Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to begin our conversation about sacred scripture. This is week two of Fundamental Theology, and we're going to talk about the privileged and unique and wonderful means by which divine revelation, the Word of God, comes to us in a written form through sacred scripture. First, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move in us and move in our understanding and move in our hearts as we now examine the scriptures which you inspired and which you still make your dwelling. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, sacred scripture, Revelation's written expression. Where does the word scripture come from anyway? What's it mean? Greek word, grammata, just means writings. So we're just shortening things up a little bit. When we talk about scripture, really we're talking about sacred scripture, holy writings. And I wanna point out that the original form of these holy writings were not in a collection, but in, in, as individual books. And those individual books over time became assembled first inside of synagogues, then in Christian communities used in the liturgy, <clears throat> and then ultimately, you know, there were lists made of them. We, uh, we'll talk about the canon a little bit. But finally, they're put in a single bound volume. They weren't in a bound volume originally. The bound volume, or a, it's called a codex in the ancient world, and the codex bound volume was a technological innovation that really didn't catch on and become used for large volumes until generally speaking pretty much the fourth century so our first codexes that put the various books together in one volume they date from the fourth century we have four that we depend upon along with many other individual writings of scriptures. There are four ancient codexes that we actually depend upon for our current versions of the New Testament and Old Testament, okay? But the point I'm making here is the word Bible. We're very used to carrying around a book that has the whole, uh, all the scriptures in them, and we call that the Bible. The word Bible really is plural in Greek, biblia, and it's a library. It's the books. Okay, and we have it bound in one book, but just keep in mind that putting them together in the book is not the originally way they came. They came as individual writings of prophets, um, and of apostles, of, of, of gospel writers, evangelists. Okay. The first thing we want to discuss about scripture, sacred scripture, is the doctrine of inspiration. And we're not going to take a lot of time on this. Whole books are written about inspiration. But just suffice it to say that there are a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that hint at this doctrine, and it's assumed throughout the whole tradition. It's just assumed. It's not clearly taught about and explained until the end of the 19th century. Why? Because modern scripture scholarship started to challenge it, really, and call it into question. And so it had to be explicitly taught. All right? But it was just assumed. But here we go. In scripture, here's the origin, the, the mentions of, revelation, of, of uh, inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's how the RSV renders it. There are some who say that in the Greek, um, it could be rendered differently. All scripture inspired by God. Um, the, but the point is, there's still the writer of 2 Timothy, whether it be Paul or some think uh, one of his disciples. Whoever wrote 2 Timothy um, assumes that 
that there are scriptures that are inspired that we are using in the church, okay? So the word inspiration clearly goes along with these holy writings. And we see in 2 Peter 2, that's one of the later books most people think of the New Testament. That says, first of all, you must understand this, that there is no prophecy of scripture, that it's a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay, so he talks about scripture in terms of prophecy here. People moved by God. This also implicitly saying that the Holy Spirit, it seems, is God. Um, first Timothy, excuse me, first Clement, one of the earliest apostolic father's writings from about 95 AD. First Clement also mentions and assumes the doctrine of inspiration of what we now call the Old Testament scriptures and perhaps even some of the new Christian writings. But he's primarily talking about Old Testament scriptures in First Clement. Okay, now, although we see in Second Peter a mention of the prophetic model, you know, that scripture comes from prophecy. We've got to just be careful when we think about prophecy. Thus saith the Lord, an oracle. Um, a lot of folks have assumed in the history of Christianity that prophets, when they say thus saith the Lord, got a word by word dictation from the Holy Spirit. Um, and that therefore scripture is dictated. And we even have this symbolized in art. There's many times that evangelists or Paul are depicted with the Holy Spirit, a dove on his shoulder. Um, and so this idea of verbal dictation is actually part of fundamentalism. It's one of the fundamentals that back in the early 20th century, the people at Princeton, the fundamentalists wanted to um, assert and they wanted to defend against the modernists and against the, the, the radical biblical criticism people. All right. Now, verbal dictation model has a problem. Um, the church has never taught or clearly, you know, uh, said in any that that this that the Holy Spirit whispered the words into the ears, literal word by word dictation into the ears of the writers of the Old and New Testament. The problem with this is it's clear as you study the New Testament and the Old Testament that there's a big difference in style from book to book or writer to writer. Just in the Gospels, you can see a difference in vocabulary and style between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and especially John and the other three. So it would just seem very odd for the Holy Spirit to be dictating different styles if he was dictating word by word. And therefore, if you hold woodenly to this, it just seems that a good close reading of the Bible would disprove it and therefore call the doctrine into question. And that's exactly what happened in the 19th century with biblical criticism. Okay, so that's why the fundamentalists had to try to defend it. And actually early on, um, the magisterium of the church was very careful about it. It took until really through the, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, it took a while for the church's magisterial judgment to mature and in Dei Verbum to try to explain inspiration and something that flows from it that we're going to talk about in a minute, inerrancy. But suffice it to say this, that we don't have clear teaching and there's different theories on how the Holy Spirit inspires the biblical writers. All right. What we can tell you is, here's what the teaching of the church is very clearly. Providentissimus Deus, 1890s, first great encyclical on scripture by Leo XIII. Leo is aware of all the debates, the, the revival of Catholic biblical scholarship, which he supported. Also, the radical criticism of the Protest some of the Protestants going on in the 19th century. So he wants to teach a little bit about scripture, great encyclical. Highly recommend you read all of it. Um, parts of it are assigned reading for this course, Fundamental Theology. But anyway, here's what some people were saying, well, some parts of scripture are inspired and other parts aren't. And clearly that is a false solution to the problem. So Leo the 13th says, no. Okay, so here's via negativa. Inspiration, you can't teach 
that inspiration is limited to certain verses or certain parts or certain books of the Bible. All the verses of the Bible are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, I, we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we talk about inerrancy. But suffice it to say now that I think we need to recover a, one of the fathers of the church's view, and I think it's a general view of the fathers, but there's just one father by the name of Origen, a guy from the third century, the first great Bible scholar in the history of the church. He was an amazing character, and if you'd like to know more about him, read about him in When the Church Was Young, my book uh, on the early fathers of the church, okay? But this man was amazing. He wrote amazing amount of commentary on scripture. He did an amazing amount of work of exegesis and took the trouble to learn Hebrew. And uh, he just did a whole lot. But one of the things he says is the authors are inspired, but even more importantly, the books are inspired. They are like a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit dwells in them still and communicates life to us when we read. And I want to encourage you to meditate on that and think about that. It's not just the authors who are inspired. You know, that, that, that would be something that happened in the past and is all over with. But no, the scriptures are God-breathed. Remember, the Holy Spirit um, comes in the form of wind and a breath. So the scriptures are alive. This is the way all the fathers looked at the scriptures, alive with the Spirit, a place where the Spirit dwells. When we go to scripture, we encounter the Holy Spirit. We want to interpret scripture by means of the same Spirit by which it was inspired in the first place. So anyway, uh, that's a beautiful, a beautiful thought, that the, the Holy Spirit is, is dwelling in the scriptures as in a tabernacle, as in a temple, okay? And also, going along with this, something very common you find in the Fathers, the scriptures are like a body of Christ um, with the Holy Spirit as the soul of this body. So the church has always venerated the scriptures as she venerates the Lord's body. That's the way that we, we see it expressed in the catechism. But early on, this is, this is the way that the church talked about it uh, in the Fathers and in the medievals. As a matter of fact, they say that we feed from two tables in the Eucharist, the table of the Word, the Ambo, and the table of the Eucharist, the altar. So in a certain way, we're feeding on the body of Christ in both ways. And this is one thing about the bread of life discourse. Protestants tend to see the bread of life discourse as talking about feeding on the Lord's Word spiritually. Catholics see it as feeding on the Lord's body sacramentally. Well, they're both true. There's no dichotomy. So when we do the Eucharist, we always feed on the Word before we feed uh, at the table and feed on the sacrament. Okay, let's talk about authorship. God is the author of sacred scripture. Does that mean he sat down and wrote it? And no. The word auctor means originator in Latin. So, auctor, how do we think of Moses as the author of the first five books of the Bible? Well, he can't be the writer because it recounts, Deuteronomy recounts his death. Obviously, he couldn't have written about his death. But Moses is the originator. So, in a very real sense, Moses is the author, not the writer, okay? Uh, we talk about God as the author of life. We're not talking about him as a writer. We're talking about him as the originator. So this is how we say that the scriptures are, have God as its author. If the Holy Spirit inspires all of the scriptures and the writers, then they find their origin in God. Now, this is important because we've got to keep in mind that all the books of the Bible often also have the human writer and that writer is a true author, meaning a creative contributor. Uh, his humanity, his style, his own metaphors, his figures of speech are not blotted out or canceled out by the Holy Spirit in inspiration. 
And we see this obviously because all these different books of the Bible have different figures of speech, different styles. That's part of really the study uh, of the New Testament, Old Testament, the professional exegetical study. It notes difference in vocabulary, difference in style. This is part of where you know you get uh, different ideas from regarding dating uh, and regarding you know multiple people contributing to the Book of Isaiah, for example. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, some some very strong evidence that there was a different writer in some of Paul's epistles. Well, we know Paul dictated them. We know in the ancient world that um, an author of a, an important person who's dictating a letter would give a broad freedom to the writer to express his ideas. Um, we see in Galatians where Paul even says at the end, see, I'm writing this, I'm signing this in my own hand, Paul, which means that the rest of the letter was actually dictated and written by one of Paul's companions. Uh, I mean, it was dictated to, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is it's important for us to understand God as author doesn't cancel out the real human authorship, the, the humanity of each of the biblical texts. It's very legitimate to study the differences in style and look at the differences in theology between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? And we can see that at the same time hold to the fact that God was the author of all of those four Gospels through the Spirit who inspired the four writers to express the mystery of Jesus, the Gospel, in their own words, in their own way of speaking. Okay, so bottom line, the Bible is both a library of different books with different styles written in different times, historically conditioned, and on the other hand, it's a single volume with the same author, the Holy Spirit, also is unified by the same content, the Word of God, with a capital W, the Gospel, which is prepared for, you know, and preached in a hidden way in the Old Testament, and comes to fulfillment in what Jesus said and what he did and how his apostles explained that, okay? So the Bible is unified by an author, the same author, the Holy Spirit, and the same content, which we discussed in the last class. Okay, now we're gonna get the toughest subject in the discussions at Vatican II about Scripture. And actually, it started to be discussed and wrangled with and struggled with all the way back with Leo XIII in the 1890s. Um, it's a continual battle because we want so much to say, we have to say, if God is the author of sacred Scripture in every case, there can be no error. How can there be error? God can't deceive. So inerrancy, that doctrine has always been an assumption from the beginning in Judaism and Christianity. But modern biblical science, first of all, modern science shows us the world couldn't have been created in six literal days. The world's a lot older than 6,000 years, and that's how old, well, 6,000 years, 6,000 BC, I can't remember, but somewhere like around there is if you really work all the genealogies literally in the Bible, that's where the beginning of the world is. And obviously, we're learning a whole lot more about, you know, lots of things uh, having to do with how old the universe is and how old the world is. It says in Genesis 2 that God formed Adam out of the clay of the earth. And it just seems that there's much evidence that there, the human being uh, evolved from life forms that, that you know, not, didn't come directly out of clay, but came from, you know, primates who in turn came from other animals. And, you know, uh, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to really uh, expound on uh, evolutionary theory right now and how much is fact and how much is conjecture. All I can say is this, these scientific discoveries have called into question the inerrancy of the Bible. How can you say the Bible's inerrant when, you know, it's showing us things that can't be true, you know? Uh, we find historical, slight historical inaccuracies or inconsistencies in Scripture. So all this called into question the doctrine of inerrancy. You have Christians wanting to defend that. But at the same time, we in the Catholic Church never believe that you can, that there's any potential conflict between faith and reason. 
So somehow we've got to understand how this all fits together. And that's really what went on from the 1890s all the way through Vatican II. Um, and I wouldn't say that we have no more to learn about it or no, no more refinements will be made, but I just, there's been a huge uh, distance covered between 1890s and, and Vatican II on this question. Okay, so First Clement is a good example of uh, the fact that there is an assumption of the inerrancy of Scripture. Okay, so you can, you can basically take a look at that. You can also take a look at that. Um, you can take a look at the, what Leo XIII says in Providentissimus Deus. That is assigned part of your reading. Okay, you can read the whole Providentissimus Deus online. But again, I'm just going to say the value of a book like The Christian Faith, the doctrinal documents of the Catholic Church, is that you have topically organized great excerpts from great documents like Providentissimus Deus. Okay, so here's what the, the document says. What the Holy Spirit inspires the, writing, the writers to assert is truth pertaining to salvation. Okay? Now you can find that, uh, you know, in Spiritus Paracletus also, which is 1920s kind of vintage. That's Benedict the 15th. So this is there, okay? Um, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of still debate going on even after Leo, after uh, Benedict the 15th. So that's why Dave Verbum really worked on this and they're trying to make clear this whole problem. And it took, that's why it took four years to get this document passed. But there's an important footnote that helps us understand what we're talking about here, okay? And the footnote references Augustine and it references Thomas Aquinas. The footnote is numbered differently in different editions of Vatican II, but I just wanna make sure that you're aware of it, all right? The footnote cites Gen uh, Augustine, Genesis ad literam, the literal interpretation of Genesis. It also cites him in one of his letters, letter 82. Basically, here's what Augustine says. Though the sacred writers may have known astronomy, nevertheless, the Holy Spirit didn't intend to utter through them any truth apart from what pertains to salvation. In other words, the Holy Spirit was not intending to inspire the gospel writers or the writers of Genesis or anybody to give us just secular history or give us science, biology, cosmology, whatever. The only thing the Holy Spirit was intending to inspire the authors to write and teach was things that pertain to salvation. So you can't say that scripture materially is this part inspired, this part not. But you can say formally, okay, that the point of inspiration and the truth that is asserted by the sacred author that is inspired is truth that pertains to salvation. Nothing else, the, you know, the, all the writers of the, of the Bible, they all were people of their age, their historically conditioned. So Old Testament writers, New Testament writers are gonna assume that the world is flat. That was part of the way they looked at it, that the sun was moving around the earth. That's the way they just looked at it. God's not gonna teach them science and prevent them from just assuming what they always assume have, having to do with science. He's gonna let them use their vision of the world and through that proclaim saving truth. Okay, so the point is, we can't say, ah, oh, the Gospels are in the Old Testament. Uh, the Bible can't be inerrant because of problems in Genesis 1 through 11, not, not jiving with science. No, it's not trying to teach science, okay? Same thing with the Gospels. Everybody's noticed since the beginning that there's differences in the Gospel accounts about chronology, exact chronology. Like, just a simple one. Did Jesus go to the temple just at the end of his life in Jerusalem, because in the Synoptic Gospels, it's a three-year ministry, but it seems he's in Galilee the whole time and then comes to Jerusalem just at the end of his life. Whereas John's Gospel shows him going back and forth. He's back and forth between Jerusalem and Galilee all the time. Okay, well, the Gospel writers aren't trying to teach us the literal blow-by-blow -blow history of Jesus' ministry. What they are trying to show us is what he taught, and they all agree about the last days of his life, the main points, you know, not little points, you know, but the main points. 
The main points having to do with his suffering, his death, his resurrection. They all agree there, that's what's important historically to assert. So that's what all the three gospel writers assert, okay? When Jesus said this as opposed to that, where he said this as opposed to that is not something they're really interested in us knowing. You know, just note, they don't tell us his height, his eyes. They don't tell us a whole lot about who his cousins were. They don't tell us a whole lot in the scriptures about his grandparents. We'd love to know that stuff. But it wasn't important for our salvation to tell us that stuff, so they didn't tell us that stuff. Uh, other things that made, their, that made its way in there, you know, we may find some very interesting historical things in the Bible, but that's not what general historical truth is not what they're about. They're about saving history, history of salvation. Okay, so it's a very, really a simple principle. Um, and Aquinas is also cited because he says much the same thing in De Veritate. Quote, any knowledge which is profitable to salvation may be the subject of prophetic inspiration, but things which cannot affect our salvation do not belong to inspiration. That's about as clear as you can get. So, you know, Aquinas way back in the 13th century is giving us a solution to a problem that we're struggling with now because of advances in science. Okay, so one of the other things we just need to say about inerrancy is inerrancy presumes the Catholic approach two other things that are very important. One is pedagogy, the provisional, temporary, gradual character of Old Testament revelation. So we actually don't, we see some pretty nasty things in the Old Testament like polygamy. Is God teaching us positively polygamy is good? No, he's tolerating it just like he tolerated divorce because it wasn't time to teach people stuff yet. So you'll find some statements um, you know, for example, in the Psalms or in Job, according to their literal sense, they say things like, you know, after death, no one can praise you. Now, we, we just have to understand that they didn't know that that revelation hadn't been there yet, okay? Hadn't been given yet of eternal life, the revelation of heaven. And so we interpret them now, and this is the second principle, we interpret all scripture passages in light of the whole of scripture and final revelation of Jesus Christ. So we read the Psalms now, for example, we read cursing Psalms, you know, about uh, Lord smite my enemies. We interpret them spiritually to mean evil spirits because Christ taught us we don't want to hurt our human enemies. We want them converted, you know? So the point is we interpret earlier revelation in light of later revelation in Christ, all right? And this is called the analogia fidei or the analogy of faith. The word analogy means proportional relationship, okay? So the analogy of being means that there's some correspondence between um, a human father and God as father. So we can actually know something about God because in human fatherhood, good human fatherhood, we see something about God positively reflected, okay? That, that means there's a proportion, there's an analogy, okay? The analogy uh, that we're talking about here, the analogy of faith, is that one doctrine is related to all the others. There's a proportional relationship. You can't pull one out of context. So all of scripture is interpreted that way. When you say you're interpreting scripture according to the analogy of faith, it means you're interpreting one text in light of the whole, not on its own. Now, historical ex exegesis as a historical discipline does not immediately jump to the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith presumes you're focusing on scripture and its divine author, its divine character, its inspired character. Okay, it's totally legitimate to study scripture from the human angle of a, as a human word, all right? We'll talk about that in a minute. It's just that for Christians, we're people of faith. So we can't deny the importance of interpreting scripture also in light of the analogy of faith. That's the way we use it for our own salvation and for teaching others, okay? We don't take historical teaching from a classroom and use that necessarily, you know, in preaching, you know? Um, so it, it's just important that we have to understand that the canon of scripture means that it flows from the idea, the fact that we have everything collected in one, li one list and in one volume means that we believe in the divine authorship of scripture as well as the human authorship. We want to honor both, okay? So 
we, we interpret each text ultimately in light of the whole. Okay? We, in light of the whole canon, in light of the analogy of faith. Thank you.